It's Sunday night, and we are in a study on prophecy. I love prophecy. I've been studying prophecy for over 50 years. I started in 1964 studying the 70 weeks of Daniel. That is, without a doubt, the most crucial prophecy uh, teachings in all of the Bible. The 70 weeks, and you ask most people about the 70 weeks of Daniel, they don't have any idea what you're talking about. The 70 weeks of Daniel is in Daniel 9. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Throw it away. Throw it away. <laughs> All right. I don't have too many fresh pens. I'll see if I got some. All right. Daniel 9, 24 through 27 is the 70 weeks of Daniel. This is actually the bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. This will tell you all about it. Now, I've had people say, I don't understand when the Bible speaks of a time, times, and half a times. It'll say a time. Let me read that, erase that. It'll say a time, times, and half a times. And it will also speak of 1260 days. Or it will say 42 months. These are all the same. 42 months, if you have 12 months in a year, if you have 12 months in a year, in seven years, if you have, then you will have 84 months. Half of 84 months is 42 months. If you're talking about a Jewish calendar, they have 360 days in their yearly calendar. We've already said you get that out of the book of Genesis. You can get that by looking at over in Genesis. This is how they, they have reasons. The Jews have reasons for numbering their months and for saying that their day began, that their day began at six o'clock in the evening. Six o'clock in the evening or sundown. Now the Jewish day begins at six o'clock. Ours begins at twelve oh one or twelve o'clock midnight. That's when our day begins. You can forget when our day begins, that it doesn't count in the Bible. They go by the Jewish definition of a day. The reason being, all through the first chapter of Genesis, the Bible would say, God spoke such and such and so and so, and it was good. And the evening and the morning were the first day. It will say evening and morning. And this is why their day begins at 6 or sundown, Evening and morning are the first day. They laid it out. God laid it out where their day would begin in the evening. So anytime you're going to talk about their day, forget 12 o'clock midnight. That has nothing to do when uh, we're talking about their day. When Jesus was crucified on Friday, I went through all of that. That was, he was crucified on Friday, Friday and they said, if, you, if, you, if something started happening before 6 o'clock, that it, they had to include all the rest of the day back to the previous 6 o'clock. And the reason Jesus was crucified on Friday because it was dark from the 6th to the ninth hour. The sixth hour of the day was 12 o'clock noon. And the ninth hour was 3 in the afternoon. 
So if they get Jesus in the grave before 6 o'clock or before sundown, let's just say 6 o'clock, let's say they got him in the grave at 5.30, they had to count a part of the day as the whole. They had to count it all the way back to 6 o'clock Thursday. So he was in the if he was in the grave 30 minutes before sundown, they had to count that whole day. Then they counted the, that next day from 6 o'clock that evening, which we'd call Friday evening, but that was their 6 o'clock was, was when they would uh, begin their day. And so they had to count till 6 o'clock Saturday. And then he rose from the dead the morning of the third day somewhere while it was still dark so they had to count this day all the way to six o'clock had to count this one back to six o'clock and had to count this one that was so called the three days and three nights he was in the tomb now i'm going to get into this we need to understand what is this talking about about 360 days or 12 1260 days well 1260 days is exactly half one half of seven years seven years on a jewish 360 day calendar it's exactly half so that's the same thing as 42 months which is half of seven years on a Jewish calendar. Half of seven years would be three and one half years. Where does that three and a half years, when you measure it out this way, where does it start? A time, time, and half a time. So there are no prophecy scholars that will tell you that that means anything other than one year, one year, two years, time, times, Half a time would be half a year. Half a year. That is three and a half years. So time times and half a time is three and a half years. 1260 days is half of seven years on a 360 day Jewish calendar. And 42 months is half of seven years on their 84 month. Of course, it's not going to matter on the months. 42 months is half of seven years in our calendar, and it's half of seven years on the Jewish calendar. What we're looking at is this 1260 days. What we're looking at is that 1260 days. We've been talking about 1,000 over there in Revelation, the 20th chapter. Go back there again. Go back to Revelation, the 20th chapter. I'm going to teach this until we can get a hold of a lot of it because this is, people don't know anything about the word thousand. They know very little. I've got a bunch of books on numbers. I've got even a book called The History of Zero. Zero has a history. In the first century, they did not have zeros in the Greek language, had no zeros. They had zeros in among the Egyptians. They didn't have them among the Greeks. What do they have among the Greeks? Well, they had Roman numerals: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and so forth, eight, nine, I-X, X is 10, one from nine is 10, and you have X, that's 10. This is what they had. And when they come up to the word thousand, they had the word M. That doesn't look like one, zero, zero, zero. Now the writers tell us that uh, Mr. Well, anybody who studied numbers will tell you that any multiple in the first century of a hundred, of ten, or a thousand was a form of the original number. 
original number there is one. So a thousand, we look at this as a number, and it wasn't actually a number. A thousand wasn't. A thousand was a noun. Now, all numbers to us are verbs. A verb shows, modifies the, excuse me, not verbs, adjectives. We think of numbers as adjectives. An adjective tells which, what kind of, or how many. If I said uh, the the five men, the five men broke down the door. Broke down. Five, or a five, would be an adjective telling how many men broke down the door. Well, the writers tell us that 1,000, it wasn't 1,000. They didn't have any zeros. When you see 1,000, it's actually C-H-I-L-I-A. Kilia, that's what 1,000 is. Now, I got a book. Mike picked me up a book up at I asked him to go to the library or go to the bookstore up at Ball State and, add, and find out if they had a book on numbers. And they have a book on etymology of numbers. And when they will tell you in that, that one, according to mathematicians, one was not a number. One. A man, you don't have your men say, men fall out, and one guy comes running out there, and he stands at attention. You don't say, now, count off, one. You don't do that. <laughs> one is a generator. This is what the mathematicians tell us. It's a generator of numbers. It's a generator of numbers. One generates two. You don't start counting in the first century till you get to two. Now, you say, that don't make sense to me. That's because you didn't live in the first century. They didn't start counting till they got to two. They had to have more than one to count. Now, I'm going to read to you. They said that thousand... They said thousand was a noun just like dozen. Now we know dozen means twelve of something, twelve of something. A dozen eggs, a dozen people, twelve of something. And it's just like deer. The deer crossed the road. How many deer? One or 25? Well, there has to be a generator of numbers. In order to understand how many thousand, there has to be, it has to be something that modifies the thousand to tell how many And whenever the Bible says the or a thousand, it's like saying a what? What did I write where? A J U S A N D. Now in the Greek language. We think of articles. 
an article in the English language is a definite article, the, that's a definite article. And you also, in English, you have indefinite articles, indefinite, indefinite articles. And the indefinite articles is a and an. The problem is in the Greek language, there are no indefinite articles. There is only the. The means it's a specific the. Now, whenever you look here in, in Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 1, I'm trying to explain the difference between between 1260 days the fact that you've got 260 denotes that the thousand is only one it doesn't say it doesn't say a thousand 260 days if it does it's wrong because there are no a's and ands in the Greek None. Now, look here, back in. I'm trying to show you the difference between a definite article and an article that is indefinite that's not in the Greek text. So whenever you find 8,000, it's not there. You won't find it in your interlinear Bible. It's just not true. Uh, it just says 1,000. It, you have to go by the context. Now, the context in the 20th chapter of Revelation, here's the context. What is the thousand years for? That's the context, and it'll show you what it's for. In Revelation, Revelation 20, I saw an angel, the verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. That's not a literal key. It's not a literal chain. The whole purpose of Satan being bound here is going to tell you what the thousand is. Let me read it. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil. So the serpent is the diabolos, a traducer, one who deceives and leads away, and Satan, Satan, adversary. Satan means adversary. And he's going to bind someone here, or he's being bound. And this angel laid hold on the dragon. Now, the dragon is Satan. The dragon is the is the devil being bound and laid hold of the old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him see where it says 8,000 it's not there all it says bound him killia killia there is no 1000 in the Greek language it's not there just cross that out. doesn't say 8,000 years. It says bound to him 1,000 years. What he's bound for is going to tell you the context of this, how long the 1,000 years is. It's going to tell you if it's 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, or 1,000. The A is not in the text. This is where people... The only place that people come up with millennium is this chapter right here. And if you can show what it's actually about, you're going to find out it doesn't mean what the preachers are saying. Now, and cast him into the bottomless pit. It's not a literal pit, and there's not a literal casting. We keep saying bottomless pit is the word abusos, A B. U-S-S-O-S. -S -S. That is the word bottomless pit. It doesn't mean bottomless pit. 
That's one of the t worst translations in all the Bible. The word is abusos. It is a construction of the word bathos. Bathos. Bathos means something with great knowledge. Something with great knowledge. When you place the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word, it negates the word. It's called the alpha privative. Alpha privative. It negates the word just like in English. A typical means not typical. A sexual means not typical sexual. A bathos, which is the word abusos, it comes from the alpha, bathos. It means a place of no knowledge. And it boils back to, it boils down to, Satan is bound, bound is the word dio. It means to forbid. Satan is forbidden from doing something for this thousand years or the two thousand years, whatever it is. Now, here's what it says. Let me find the... Let me get the... Uh, let me get the... Mediterranean Sea over here on this. Here, how's this? Here's the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea area was the boundaries of the World Beast system. And the World Beast system, all through the Old Testament, the only people that had any knowledge of God, Bathos, the only people was Israel, right here. No one else, God had not opened their hearts to his knowledge. They didn't have it. It was forbidden for the Gentiles to have the knowledge of God until Acts 2, where God's going to part of his spirit, which is truth, on all flesh, red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh. If you can think of the church as being Israel, God is forbidding. Well, let's read it here. He has bound Satan away from the church the same way he did bound Satan away from Israel. This is the place of no knowledge, the beast world system. Let me move that like so. The beast world system is the place of no knowledge. No one was permitted not until Acts 2 did God tell the apostles in the 28th chapter of Matthew, go into all the world and teach all nations now, since Israel has rebelled against me and gone after all this fire and tree worship. Now, he says here, here's what he's forbidden from doing. And cast him into the bottomless pit, into the place of no knowledge, and locked him away from a group of Gentiles and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousands years. Notice I said thousands years was finished. There's only one place in all the Bible where the Gentiles, this word nations is the word ethnos. Ethnos is the word nation. And it is also the word Gentile. This is where people get confused. It's also the word Gentile. There is one place where the Gentiles cannot be deceived in all of time. I put these things on the board, and I do it over and over so you can understand. 
you can't just get this all of a sudden. I've studied this for 60 years. It's not something you grab a hold of real quick. So the nations, there has to be a time and place where the Gentiles cannot be deceived. Well, the Gentiles were deceived over here in the Old Testament from Adam, actually from Abraham, all the way till Jesus. And the Gentiles was not given the truth till Acts, the second chapter, because Israel kept going after Baal, Grove, Shemosh, Molech, Isis, Osiris, all the nations, the gods, the fire gods and the tree goddesses that were all around them. And God says, because of the hardness of their hearts, I'm going to blind the Jews. I've got a period of time. So far, it has been 2,000 years. Been 2,000 years since the Gentiles have not been able to be deceived as a whole. The Gentiles can't be deceived. And we're not talking about all Gentiles in the world. We're talking about black, red, yellow, white, and brown. Men from every nation, tongue, and tribe. Whereas over here, it was only the descendants of Abraham. Through this bloodline, it was only Jews that could have the truth over here. Now we're in a period of time. We're in a period of time where the Gentiles cannot be deceived. They're men from every nation, tongue, and tribe. Remember the word synecdoche. Synecdoche means a part of something if is the whole. If one red man, one black man, one red man, one yellow man, one white man, one brown man is saved, they would say all flesh is saved, a part is the whole. The only place where the Gentiles can't be deceived is the New Testament Gentile church. And we are spiritual Israel. We're heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn. At the end of that period... That will be the end of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And that's going to be, I believe that's not too far away. At the end of the church, there's not going to be a pre-trib rapture. There's not going to be a thousand years. We can really see that when we look back at Revelation Seven, uh, Revelation 10, we can see. Here's the end of time. You need to understand something about Revelation. Revelation is not a sequence of events. Well, something happening and something following that and something following that. These are separate visions that John is having of different things happening. Well, I stepped on my pinhead here. Some people think I'm a pinhead. All right. <laughs> I think most people are pinheads that can't understand the truth. That's now, a song by the huh? Pinhead is a song by the Ramones. <laughs> I, need, I need to know that. <laughs> by the who? Ramones. Ramones, okay. Pinhead, huh? Ramones was a rock group. All right, he knows all about them. All right. The end of, at the end of the church, when we are taken out to meet the Lord in the air, that was when the, the church will be complete and nobody else will come into the kingdom. When you look at Revelation 10, well, actually, when you look at Revelation 8, 9, and 10, you see seven angels with seven trumpets. They're the same seven angels that you find in the first chapter. And Christ is standing amidst the seven candlesticks. And he's got seven stars in his right hand. The Bible tells you who they are in verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars 
which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angels of, you can put seven because it's seven angels, of the seven churches. And the seven churches are, that you saw us, are the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So the seven angels are always the same all the way through this. Then when you get over to the 10th chapter of Revelation, Revelation 10, well, let's look at 8, first of all. Here's these seven angels. They're all given a trumpet. We've said that trumpets are voices. They sound orders. When you're supposed to go in the battle, they go da 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 charge. When it's time to go to bed and go to sleep, they play taps. Trumpets are voices. And we see the seven angels were given seven trumpets. In verse 6, the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounds in verse 1. Before I go any further, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, will not be dead and in the grave, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. We're going to be taken out to meet the Lord in the air when the last trumpet sounds. You've got seven angels here with seven trumpets. The first one sounds in verse 7. The first angel sounds. I'm not going to go into all the things that happen right now. I'll do that later. Verse 8, the second angel sounds. Verse 10, the third angel sounds. And then in verse, in verse 12, the fourth angel sounds. And then in chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounds. Now, there's a set of angels, but the one we're looking for is the last trump. And then here in verse 13 of chapter 9, the sixth angel sounds. We see the seventh angel coming in chapter 10. Chapter 10, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. This is Christ. Angel is the word angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. It merely means messenger. You need to take every word that's got angel in your Bible and just cross that out and say messenger. That's all the word angel means. doesn't mean anything but that. You can be, well, you can't be. There can be a heavenly angel named Michael, and he's a death angel. There can be a heavenly angel named Gabriel. He's a messenger of God. He went to Daniel in Daniel 9, 23, 22, 23, and talks to Daniel about the 70 weeks. It was Gabriel that went to Mary and announced that she was going to have a, a child by the Holy Spirit. Gabriel was the announcing angel. But all of the pastors of churches were called angels because they were messengers. Throw out the word angel and just substitute messenger everywhere you see it. It can be me. If I'm, if you send your son next door, your daughter next door to borrow from sugar from the lady next door, he's an angel. Not because he's cute, but because he has got a message to go next door. That's what an angel is. So these seven angels are sounding their trumpets. When you get to chapter 10, this angel had in his hand a little book. We see that little book is written upon our hearts. That's the same thing as the law written on tables of stone inside the Ark of the Covenant of the Old Testament. The law was written on tables of stone kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. You can see that in Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Then he says, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered 
and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. And at the sounding of the seventh angel, some things happened. At the sounding of the seventh angel, he announces, Time is no more. At the sounding of the last trump, sounding of last trump, there is no more time. And we're going to be changed at the last trump. So there can't be a pre-trib rapture because if there is no seven year, if we're at the end of time when we're taken out, there is no pre-trib rapture, is there? No pre-trib. And if time is no more after that seventh trump, you can do away with a pre-trib rapture because we're going to be changed at the last Last is the word eschatos, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-S. We get our word eschatology, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. It comes from eschatos and logos. It means the last in a series of sounds after which no other trumpet will sound. When the last trump sounds and we're taken out to meet the Lord in the air, there's no more time. There's no rapture after that. We're going to be taken out at the very end of time. And time is no more when we're taken out to meet the Lord in the air at the sounding of the last trump. I want you to get that in this. Look at this. And he swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. And the seventh trump, or the last trump, is about to sound. And then he says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh or the last trumpet, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, According to Ephesians, the third chapter, and the, and the fifth chapter, the mystery of God is the church. The reason it's a mystery is because God only reveals himself to a certain few. Only few are going to find the narrow way. Only few. It is a little flock. Fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There's only going to be a few. And at the end of time, at the end of time, we'll be taken out to meet the Lord in the air. When there is no more time, there can't be a thousand year reign because it's not thousand. The whole purpose of the thousand year, actually thousands, is so that during that time period of the 2,000 years, during that time period, Gentiles, the, let me put it this way, the New Testament, spiritual Israel, church, cannot be deceived, and it will be a Gentile church, an ethnos church, same word as nation there, in the 20th chapter, same word as nation, ethnos, and the Gentiles will not be deceived. That's the only place in time. You have the beginning, the Gentiles were deceived over here all the way to Jesus, and then God opens up their eyes in Acts 2, and he's got people out of every nation, tongue, and tribe that are the predestinated elect of God. And they won't be able to be deceived all the way till there is no more time at the very end and we'll be taken out to meet the Lord in the air. That's going to come upon us. It's going to come upon the nations as travails upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. There's not going to be an escape for people. This always bothered me when I was growing up. But let me finish reading this. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound, 
the mystery of God should be teleates, finished. Teleates means complete. Remember the word teleos, which is a form of teleates. Teleos, teleos is the word perfect, be therefore perfect. It means to be matured. The church is not only going to be matured, time will not be any more when the Gentile church cannot be deceived during this last 2,000 year period. I want, wanted to go through this again so you can see this. What really confuses people is here the mystery is God is going to be finished at the signing of the last trump and they don't even connect this last trump. Most people don't even connect it to the last trump of 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one. Behold, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. The, this pre-trib rapture thing was brought to America around 1836 by a man named J.N. Darby. It's called Darbyism. It is an ism. He brought it to America, and when he brought it to America, he not only brought it to America, but he brought it to America and brought with it premillennialism. There is no millennium when the last trumpet sounds, time is over, and the church is complete, and that's where we're taken out to meet the Lord in the air. There's no thousand years. There's no pre-trib rapture. We're going to be changed at the last trump, and the last trump is right here in Revelation 10. When the last trumpet sounds, there's two things that happens at the sounding of the last trump. Two things. The church is taken out to meet the Lord in the air. And in Revelation 11 and 15, it shows the last trumpet sounding in 11 and 15. This is not two different trumpets sounding. It's a picture just like John has seen all through the book of Revelation. He sees a picture from here and he sees another picture of the same event happening over here. Re in Revelation is not chronological happenings. You got the end of time in Revelation 6. You got the end of time in Revelation 8. You got the end of time in Revelation 10 that we just read. No more time, no pre-trib rapture there is no millennium millennium is mill and annum that's not the word in the greek mill means a thousand years it's not thousand the only place the key is what is the forbidding for what is the binding of satan for it is to keep him from deceiving the nations which is the same word ethnos, nations, and Gentile. The only place Gentiles cannot be deceived is through this period right here till the end of time, when time is over, here when the seventh trumpet sounds. There are seven, what's amazing to me, there were seven trumpets sounding when Joshua conquered Jericho. When he conquered Jericho, seven priests marched around the Jericho seven days and sounded seven trumps. And the seventh time around, they sounded the trumpets seven times, and the walls fell down immediately. At the sounding of the seventh trump, all of God's enemies will be destroyed. That's what the Bible says. In fact, that's what it says in Revelation eleven fifteen. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All of the kingdoms are conquered at the sounding of the seventh trump. And the kingdom that is destroyed, when you go over here, there's a kingdom. Death is a kingdom. Death reigns over all men. When you go over here, 
to 1 Corinthians 15. All the kingdoms will be conquered. Death is a kingdom. And what the Bible says here in verse 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God was a term for Israel. Kingdom of God was a term for the church. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father whom he shall have put down all rule. That's the same thing. What in the world? Uh, that's the same thing when he puts down all real rule when he says the kingdom of this world will come the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he reigns forever and ever. And all authority and power is put down. Verse 25, And he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Two things happen at the signing of the last trump. The church is complete and finished. We're changed at the last trump. And all of his enemies are conquered. Verse 26, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So when the last trumpet sounds, death. The seventh trumpet sounds, the Bible says in Revelation 11 and 15, death is conquered. Isn't that right? Y'all understand that? Is that hard to understand? It's not really, is it? Death is conquered. Death is conquered at the signing of the seventh trump. God conquers all of his enemies. And he says the same thing in Philippians, the second chapter, the very last verse here. Ephesians, Philippians. I'm just kind of reviewing this so we can get to the 1260 days. Now, here in Philippians, excuse me, 3. Philippians 3 and verse 21. This will be at the last trump. Speaking of Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, the inner gale, E N E R G E O. We get our word energy from that. It comes from N and ergon. Ergon means to work or toil within. God will toil within us, and when he conquers his enemies, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. He's going to subdue death, and that will be at the last trump right here when there's no more time, right? Who was that? Strange. Put something in the offering box. Really? Oh, okay. Wonderful. Anyway. Anyway, now, I want to, let's look. So, we see his enemies being destroyed in verse 21 of chapter 3 of Philippians. We see in Revelation 11 and 15, we see all of his enemies conquered at the signing of the seventh trump or the last trump. You have seven trumpets. You have seven trumpets in the ecclesiastical year of the Jews. The ecclesiastical year had to do with their crops coming in. Their crops come in in March, April. The first crops, the wheat and the barley harvest are coming in. That's the first fruits of the land. Let me erase this over here. I started to tell you about where the end of time is in Revelation 6, Revelation 8, Revelation 10, Revelation uh, 11, 
In fact, you've got three and a half days That's going to be three and a half years. You got three and a half days where the two witnesses lie dead in the streets. Lie dead. This is the same thing as three and a half, or actually 1260 days. 60. It's the same thing as 42 months. And the two witnesses is the church, isn't it? Gosh, I don't need to go into the two witnesses right now. The two witnesses you'll find in Numbers 35 and 30, where the Bible says it takes two witnesses to put a man to death in Israel. And then in Deuteronomy seventeen six and 7, At the mouth of two witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. And the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death. That's why the Bible says, When the woman was taken in adultery, let him that is without sin not cast the first stone. It doesn't say that. It says first cast the stone. But you have to understand something about the two witnesses. They have to be a reliable witness. And if you lied and you threw the first stone and you weren't telling the truth, you had to suffer the penalty of the one you're going to put to death. If it's a capital offense and you accuse somebody and they're about to take the stones up to stone this woman and they turned and looked at you and said, we found out you're lying then you have to lay down in front of them and be stoned. And he tells you that over in the 19th chapter of Deuteronomy. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, for any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up, then shall you do unto him as he thought to do unto his brother." If you were a false witness and you were a witness against somebody, whatever the penalty was going to be and you, felt, and you got found out before they executed it, they had to turn to you and say, you have to suffer the penalty. That's why do you think they, those Pharisees in John the 8th chapter, Jesus falls down on the ground and begins to write something. I believe he wrote down these verses out of Deuteronomy 19 and 15 through 19 where he says if a false witness rise up he has to suffer the penalty boy if it was that way today it wouldn't be a lot of lying mafia or mob people lying about something because they'd have to be put into the electric chair or whatever now where was i all right let's just look at that over there in i gave you the two witnesses look over here in Revelation 11, you got the end of time in Revelation 11. You got the end of time in Revelation 14, when the blood goes up to the bridle, the to the bridles of the horses. It doesn't mean there's going to be a river of blood flowing this deep, like the horses' bridles at this high. It don't mean that. It means it's going to splash that high. All the blood in the world wouldn't fill up a river going through that valley in Israel all the blood that's ever been because we only want to have five pints and how many would that take for there be a river of blood that's not what it's talking about it's talking about the blood will be splattering up to the bridle horses bridles of the horses and that is a figure of speech about the slaughter that will come about at the end of time it's just a figure of speech now means a lot of people will die where did i say we were going now Huh? 11. Oh, 11. Yeah, Revelation 11. Here's the two witnesses, and here's how long they're going to be dead. All right, Revelation 11. All right, 
there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. Now, this was written in 96 A.D. That's when this was written. That's when John the Revelator, or John the Beloved, wrote the book of Revelation, approximately 96 A.D. Now, what is the temple of God now? When this was written in 96 A.D., the temple of the Jews had been destroyed in 70 A.D., and all the rituals of the Jews were destroyed in 33 A.D., when Jesus was nailed to the cross, when they wanted to do away with one contract and start another, they would take the contracting parties, the original parties in public who had the original contract, and they would ask the two witnesses, are you privy to the fact of the old contract? Yes. And ask the two contracting parties, you want to invalidate this contract? They'd say yes, and then drive a nail through it, like we will take a notary stamp and they would invalidate the contract. The only thing that was blotted out was the handwriting of ordinances. The law was not blotted out. Can you go out and kill somebody now? Can you steal? No. None of the the only thing that was blotted out was the rituals. You got two handwritings, one on tables of stone there in Deuteronomy 9, and one on fleshy tables of our hearts. Fleshy tables of the heart. And our hearts are sprinkled. We're the house of God. Our hearts are sprinkled by the high priest, which is Christ. And over here, the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled by the high priest, one of the descendants of Aaron, Moses' older brother. They were sprinkled here with blood. Our hearts are sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Now, only the rituals were blotted out. Do we make void the law through faith? We establish the law. The law is still here. We're priests and kings, aren't we? God has made us priests and kings. He's written the law in our hearts. And we know we have to do the things of God. Now, let's keep reading. But the court which is outside the temple, leave out. That's very puzzling. That's puzzling to us. They had the temple proper. They had a wall around it. Then Herod built the Gentile area for the Gentiles to come into. It's called the court of the Gentiles or the women's court. What he's actually trying to get over to us, only the God, only the people and literal Israel that have access to the Ark of the Covenant through our high priest, Jesus forever after the order of Melchizedek is a priest to us, and he speaks Christ's blood on our hearts. The Gentiles, what he is saying, the Gentiles who don't have the blood sprinkled on their hearts, they're heathens. And they're not part of the, of the Revelation 20, the Gentiles that can't be deceived. The ones that can't be deceived are the Gentiles of the New Testament church for a 2,000-year period. They can't be deceived. And let's keep reading here. And the court which is outside, notice he's measuring the temple in verse, chapter, in verse 1. What is he talking about measuring the temple? He's talking about everyone who is within the precincts of the temple which would be us because we are the temple of God. We are the candlesticks. We are the table of showbread. Our prayers of the come from this altar of incense, and our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. So those of us who are inside the church, we're measured. What would be a measurement of those inside? Huh? Yeah, the boundary. That's a good word. What would the boundary be? Huh? The what? The horizon. The what? The horizon. The horizon. Yeah. They've said horizon. 
That means a boundary The ones in the temple will be the ones who are pro horizo, been predetermined for the horizon. The horizon is the boundary of light. So when he's got a measuring stick and he's measuring, this is very figurative language. He's measuring the temple of God. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which temple ye are. So when the temple is being measured, it's talking about us being measured inside the temple. And let the Gentiles, the unbelievers are left out. These are not the Gentiles that can't be deceived. The Gentiles who are literal Gentiles and they've never been predestined by God to be in the light, those are left out. Then he says, And the court which is outside of the temple leave out, Measure not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy sh city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Where does the forty-two months come from? Gosh. I'm going to have to stop here and go back to the 70 weeks of Daniel. Because the forty-two months is the 1260 days well, let's go ahead and read the next verse. And I'll give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred. A is not in there. But the reason we know it's a thousand is because it is coupled with 260 days. You have to go by the entire context. The fact that thousand is connected with 203 score days, a score is 20, three score is 60, 1,260 days. That's half of seven years on a 360-day Jewish calendar. 42 months is half of seven years. 1,203 score days in sackcloth. These are the two witnesses. Who are the two witnesses? These are the two olive trees. The two witnesses. Two witnesses. He equals the two olive trees. If people would study the Bible like this, define everything and put it down in its perspective, two olive trees. Where is that mentioned the first time in the Bible? Where are the two olive trees? Huh? Zechariah, the fourth chapter tells you exactly who the two olive trees is the two witnesses are the two witnesses that we read to you a while ago that it takes for a person to witness against a person to cause him to die in numbers 35 and 30 and deuteronomy the 17th chapter deuteronomy the 18th chapter what are these are the two olive trees look at zechariah 4 but who are the two olive trees? Zechariah, the fourth chapter. Zach. We got Zach that comes here. I love Zach. He loves his truth. Zechariah, the fourth chapter. That's the next to the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah, fourth chapter. Zechariah sees candlesticks with two olive trees standing beside the candlesticks. And the two olive trees are entering their oil of these. Oil is always a picture and a type of the Holy Spirit or the truth. So these two olive trees are emptying themselves into the candlesticks. If the two olive trees are the two witnesses, and the Bible says they are, then where does the, the two olive trees are 
giving the seven candlesticks their light. Where does the light come from when the preacher's preaching? It comes from the preacher. The oil comes from his mouth. That is the truth. And then he says here in verse 10, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet, the measuring line, the same thing he's doing in Revelation 11 and 1 with a measuring stick. He's measuring the temple. The plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with these seven candlesticks. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees? Upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof. There are seven candlesticks. The Bible says that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches of Asia. There in Revelation 1 and 20. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes are from the priests of God or the preacher of God gives the oil to the church or the congregation? That's like me standing up here and preaching giving you the oil or the truth. And the golden oil out of themselves. See, the most common oil they used for fire in the lamps was olive oil. And he answered me and said, Do you not know what these two olive trees are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said unto me, These two olive trees are the two anointed ones that stand or represent the Lord of the whole earth. At this time, who was it in the earth that represented God? Who was over the temple of God? The priest. the priest. And who was the leader over Israel? The king. The two olive trees are the priest and the king. Now go over, back over to Revelation. Revelation. The first chapter. In verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, that's baptism, and hath made us kings and priests. Hath made his aorist indicative, his past tense. He's already made us kings and priests He's made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So the two olive trees is the two witnesses, which is the priest and the king, which is you and I. What does a priest do? He offers acceptable sacrifice. Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you, for, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How do you do that? On a daily cross. And you're, you're not required to do that. You're commanded to do that. That's different than a requirement. You can write down a requirement and people won't obey it. When God gives a command to take your cross and die daily and deny self, that is an absolute imperative. You have to do it. If any man will come after me, Deny self, take and follow. Deny, take and follow are imperative commands. You have to die on a cross. That's giving your body a living sacrifice as a priest from God. And what does a king do? Judge he judges righteous judgment. John seven twenty four. Look not at the outward appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The king is already in us. Didn't Jesus say the kingdom of God is in you? And what does a king do? Out of our mouths comes the word of Christ who's living in our hearts 
sinning upon the Ark of the Covenant, which is our hearts, which is sprinkled with the blood of Christ, just as the Ark of the Covenant was in the Old Testament. So we are the priest and the king. We are the two olive trees. We are the two witnesses. Now let's go back to Revelation 11. You'll find in 1 Peter 2, the second chapter, that God hath made us priests. We're a royal priesthood, giving our bodies a living sacrifice. Now go back to the 11th chapter of... I'm trying to get to these 1260 days and the 42 months and the time and time and half of times. I'll give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, half of seven years. Where did these half of seven years start? Daniel 9, 27. The Bible speaks of, of how that God's going to measure out the 70 weeks of Daniel. He says, here's what's going to happen. I'll measure it out this way. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. The commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was in Nehemiah the second chapter when Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah, we'll just call him Art, when Art gave Nehemiah the letters to go back and rebuild the temple. When he gets that, when he gets that decree from Artaxerxes, that's in 444 B.C. From here unto Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks. Seventy weeks are determined upon God's people. Seventy weeks. It actually says 70 Shabua, S-H-A-B-U-A-H, which means sevens. Seventy sevens. The Jews had, they had a sabbatical year every seven years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they were supposed to keep sabbatical year, not grow anything or harvest anything every seven years. We know the reason for that. They weren't told the reason. They weren't told that the land had to breathe and it had to restore its nutrients. We know that by these environmentalists. They come out in Kansas to some farmer's uh, house and they take some land and go back to the environmentalist's office and they check it and find out what kind of, of fertilizer they need to put on that land. Well, they didn't have that back then, so God says, leave the land alone every seven years. They had 70 sets of these years. 70 times 7 is 490 years that they did not keep the sabbatical years. By the time they had 490 years passed, that land probably wasn't drawing probably jumbo tomatoes about the size of little cherry tomatoes. You do that, and that's what happens. You cannot burn the ground up Pull all the nutrients out of the ground. Ask any farmer out in Kansas. They know that. You can't do that. Well, he says, here how God's going to measure this out. He's going to take you into Babylon in 70 years. If you're not repentant from 586 B.C. until the temple is finished in 516 B.C., they didn't come back, so God says, I'm going to measure out the 70 weeks to you. I'm going to have, from the going forth of the commandments, restore and build Jerusalem. In Nehemiah, the second chapter, from the going forth of the commandment to Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. Three score in two weeks. A score is 60. Three, a score is 20. Three score is 60. Plus 7 is 67. Plus 2 is 69 of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And then God's going to blind the eyes of the Jews 
Christ comes in Jerusalem as the prince to be crowned king. He is not crowned king. They take him four days later. They crucify him as the Passover lamb. Now when he comes back, he's not coming back as this little lamb, meek and lowly. He's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire and revelation the 19th chapter. There's another chapter where the end of time is. you got the end of time in Revelation 14, Revelation 15, Revelation 16, Revelation 18, Revelation 19. you got the end of time throughout the book. It's just different views of it. Revelation 6, 8, 10, uh, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19. You have the end of time all through those chapters. Now, so he says, 69 of the weeks will pass from 444 during the days of Nehemiah and Artaxerxes unto Messiah the Prince. That's when Christ comes in Jerusalem. They're shouting, Hosanna, God save the king. God save King Jesus. And the Pharisees tell them not to say that. And Jesus said, if they don't say it, the rocks will cry out and praise the fact that I'm here. Then the Jews are going to be blinded. Then when you get to Daniel 9.27, the Jews will be blinded during the time period that the Gentiles will not be blinded. They'll be forbidden from blinding the Gentile church, and we will hear, and God will birth His New Testament Gentile church because the Gentiles won't be able to be deceived during that 2,000 year period. period. And then you'll have a time period at the end of time in Daniel 9.27 where it says in Daniel 9.27 he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This evil prince that comes. That's not what it says in the Septuagint. In the Septuagint, it says the weak shall confirm the covenant. Let me turn over there real quick. How much time to have, Mike? Let me just turn over there real quick. Daniel 9.27. I'm not going to be able to get to all these places where the time, time, and half of times and 260 days, but I'll get all of it I can. Daniel 9, 27. <coughs> You've got to blend two things together here. Daniel 9, I'll get it here in a minute. It doesn't say the week that he, the prince, will confirm the covenant. Because whose covenant is it to be confirmed? The covenant with Israel is God's covenant. How can the man of sin confirm God's covenant? He can't. Let me show you why. Daniel 9.27 Actually, you've got to blend... Daniel 9.24 with 27. What confirms the covenant according to Daniel 9.24, the angel Gabriel tells, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people to do six things. The covenant will not be confirmed until these six things come about. And here's the six things. Verse 24, 70 weeks or 70 sevens, 490 years, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city 
to do these six things, to finish the transgression where Israel was transgressing against God, going after all of these, Baal, Grove, Shemosh, all the gods of the nations around them, uh, Osiris, Isis, and the list goes on and on because they were going after all these. To make an end of the sins of Israel and to make reconciliation, kafar, the same word as atonement, for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. The most holy was the holy of holies or the house of God. When the last person comes into the fold, that will be anointing the most holy. The most holy or the house of God will be completely anointed at that point. And then he says, No, therefore, understand that from going forth the commandments. So when it says down here in verse 27, He shall confirm the covenant, that's not what it says in the original text. It says, The weak shall confirm the covenant. The only way the man of sin will confirm the covenant, he will whip Israel or the church. The man of sin will beat Israel to the end. And that will be the will of God that he does that by scourging Israel, by attacking God's people all the way to the end of time. That's the only way he will confirm it. But it'll be the week that confirms the covenant and brings about the six points of Daniel 9.24. Can you see that? That's the only way he can confirm the covenant. So he will cause the co- he will confirm the covenant with many for the last one week of the 70 weeks. People say the weeks are not separated. They are right here. 69 of them end with Christ coming to Jerusalem and they're saying God saved the king and then he blinds the eyes of the Jews there in Luke 19 chapter. If thou hast known even thou in this thy day the things that belong to thy peace. Now your eyes are blinded, Israel. And I'm opening the eyes of the Gentiles during a time period where they can't be deceived. And then he says, in the middle of the week, in the middle of the last seven and a half years, he's going to divide the last week into two parts. He's going to divide it into 1260 days, time, times, Sometimes it says dividing of times or it says half times. That's three and a half years. And for 42 months. So when you find these terms, you're talking about the last half, three and a half years, where the two witnesses of the church or the priest and king die for our testimony. And they will, and this, there will be a war against the church. You'll find that in the thirteenth chapter of Revelation. You'll also find that in the seventh chapter of of Daniel. And it will say, "He will wear out the saints." This man of sin will. Some of us, if I am alive, I will probably die for my testimony. I'll die for preaching what I'm preaching. You say, are you trying to be a martyr? No, I'm just telling you, that's what will happen. If you take a stand during this last three and a half years, you'll pay with your life. But I don't see any reason to live through that, do you? And he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's not talking about in a literal temple. Every day at six o'clock in the morning or sun up, They had a lamb offered on this. They had a lamb offered on this altar, and they had a bread offering that was called the oblation. We are the offering of the lamb. They will cause you and I to quit giving ourselves a living sacrifice with the daily cross. Somebody will outlaw preaching in public witnessing to anybody in public. I've had this experience recently. I had a bank president forbid me from witnessing inside the bank. You can't do that here, Mr. Brown. 
It'll get bigger than that, though. The time will come. will not be allowed in the bread offering. The oblation was the bread offering. The bread is the word of God. This will be forbidden. It's not talking about ceasing a sacrifice in a literal temple. If they start offering offering a sacrifice in a literal temple in Jerusalem, that will be an abomination. That will stink to God, a literal sacrifice, because a literal sacrifice in a literal temple will be a denial that Jesus is the one sacrifice offered once for all, wouldn't it? So anybody that stops a literal sacrifice in a literal temple would be good. Anybody that starts offering a sacrifice that's going to say Jesus isn't the Lamb of God. Now, let's go back over here. He'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That will be us giving our bodies a living sacrifice. We being many are one bread and one body. The bread offering was the oblation. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, till God consumes everything, and that determined upon God's people will be poured out upon the desolate. Now, let's go back over there to Revelation 11. Do I have any time? Huh? Maybe we can get to the end of this in Revelation 11. Revelation 11 is about the end of time and God dealing with our lives. I believe for preaching what I'm preaching, the time will come where they will not allow me to preach. They may send a cease and desist order, stop us from being on TV, stop us from being on the Internet, and they've got forces right now that's in the making to do that. And I will give power, verse 3, to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth at the end during the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. These are the two witnesses, two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man hurts the church, hurts the two witnesses, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Does that mean we'll become flamethrowers? No. Fire out of the mouth of God's people means preaching the word of God hard and straight. Remember over there in Jeremiah 5 and 14, the Lord said, Is not my word of fire and Israel is wood? He said was, his word was of fire and it'll break everything in pieces in Jeremiah the 23rd chapter. He said, My word is of fire. Our Lord our God is a consuming fire. What comes out of the mouth of the two witnesses or you and I is the fire of the word of God. It's the same thing I'm doing here tonight. And fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. It will be by the word of God he'll be destroyed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood. That's why people will say the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. No, they're not. It's you and I, the priest and the king. And smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will, when they shall have finished their testimony, martyrio, M-A-T-U-R-E-O. We get the word martyr from that. When they shall finish their dying for three and a half years at the end, when they shall have finished their dying the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. Where is this beast? The beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Where is it making war back here in Revelation 10? Revelation 10, back in the, prev in the previous chapter, Revelation 10, not Revelation 10, Revelation 13, excuse me. I preached on this a bunch. Revelation 13, speaking of the beast, it's not a him, it's an it. I'm not going to go into that right now. Verse 5, there was given unto it a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him, or the beast, it, 
to continue 40 and two months, persecuting the two witnesses. And he opened his, or it opened its mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. Skews, S-K-E-U-S is the word tabernacle. It, it is a form of S-K-E-N-E, -E, which means a wife that is useful to her husband. That's what tabernacle means. That's the church. So he's going to make war with the church. You're probably not going to like what the future holds for the believer. I probably won't like it either. To blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And look back here at Daniel 7. You'll see this man of sin in Daniel 7. Making war with the church. For three and a half years, a time, time, and half a times. Daniel, I may have to finish this up next week. Do I have any time? Boy, I ain't going to get there. And in verse Daniel seven twenty four, And the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. I don't have time to explain it. He shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and dividing of times, the last three and a half years. Then go back over here to Revelation 11. Revelation 11. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast world system will make war with them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. That's not the holy city. The holy city is the church, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Half of the seven years lie in the streets. That's you and I. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send Christmas gifts one to another. I just thought that put that in there. Because these two prophets, the two witnesses, the priest and the king, tormented them that dwelt in the earth and after three days and a half, the spirit of life, this is the rapture at the very end of time. Rapture is a Latin word that means to be taken out with joy. But that's not a pre-trib rapture. From God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. Great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld him, mailed them. And the same hour was this great earthquake. It's not talking about a literal earthquake. It's talking about an earthquake or a financial breaking up of the mountains of the world. When the mountains of the world come down and they're leveled, a mountain was a capital city of an empire. And this is when Christ is going to destroy everything. So this has to do with the two witnesses of the church being under attack. Can you see that? Yep. Huh? That's yep. not hard to see if you stay figurative with the language. You cannot understand Revelation unless you stay with what they meant when they said something. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither, and they ascended up. That's where we go out to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. They ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and the enemies beheld him, and the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to God of heaven. And the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. There's the, the last trump. Seventh angel sounded, there were great voices in heaven. Notice what's coming before the seventh angel sounding. 
great devastation throughout all the earth and the church will be persecuted and attacked. Now, you probably don't want to hear that, do you? <laughs> we don't want to face it when it comes. What you need to do to your kids is tell them the truth. Saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ and He reigns forever and ever. Am I out of time? I'll come back next week and we'll look at the rest of these verses on a time, time, and half a times and on 1260 days and on 42 months. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, it's very depressing to see a world that doesn't want this. I stay depressed. Lord, give me strength to keep going. I'll keep going. Thank you for suffering for you. Thank you for everything that happens. Fight our battles. Supply the need that we have, especially the spiritual need to keep going. We'll praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. Boy, oh, that was a lot of stuff, wasn't it? Oh. I got a question. With the two, the two olive trees, is that what Paul's referring to when he said, "If thou being a Gentile, were taken out of a wild olive tree?" Well, we are we are wild olive tree grafted into the into the regular branches, yeah. So the natural. The natural ones were the ones were literal Jews. Yeah, literal Jews. And we are a wild olive tree. So those are there's two, two yeah. olive trees there too. Yeah. Okay. I believe that there's going to be a certain remnant of the Jews in Israel that's going to bow. I don't see why God would make all this come about and not make the it not have a remnant of the Jews right. to come. Now especially with all those wars they've had Overwhelmingly, they were outnumbered, and they've won every war. Yeah. They won, they won the war of independence. They won the war of of fifty seven, the Sinai War, the Six Day Six War of sixty seven, yeah. and they have been completely outnumbered. And that that Yom Kippur War of seventy three, they should have lost. There's just no way they could win. We had, in fact, Michael, the guy that was a colonel over there. He was right in the middle of the war at 73. He said, we couldn't win, but we did. And he said he was told by one of, he was a young lieutenant then, and he said, I was told by one of my commanders to go to a certain house and knock on the door and tell this woman we needed help. And the lady that answered the door was go to my ear. Go to my ear. You know who go to my ear? She was the, the first great ruler of Israel after their oh, really? David Ben Gurion and her. Yeah, they were and Golda Meir is known all over the world. They made a movie about her. I have to watch it. I've been watching videos about Israel's wars and stuff. I heard I mean there were some crazy stories. Yeah, they are. And it's but what we don't want to hear is they're going to declare war against us, the believers. Stuck in the box. Hmm. See you later. You don't ever go to work. Bye. 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 Bye.